אנחנו נמצאים עכשיו ב-735 U על רחוב 57, אחד המקומות היקרים והטובים ביותר במנהטן. כאן בבניין הזה, בקומה 22, יושב אדם שעד לפני כמה שנים היה אחד החזקים ביותר בוול סטריט, אדם שהטיל חיטטו על האנשים החזקים ביותר בוול סטריט, הוא כבר לא שם. אליוט ספיצר, לשעבר התובע הכללי, הוא מושל מדינת ניו יורק, נזרק מהחיים הציבוריים לפני שלוש שנים בעקבות שערוריית מין, הוא זוהה כלקוח של רשת לנערות ליווי יקרות במיוחד. לפני שנה חזר ספיצר לזירה הציבורית עם תוכנית רעיונות ברשת CNN, אבל היא ירדה אחרי כמה חודשים. מאז ירדה התוכנית מהאוויר, ספיצר מקדיש את זמנו להוראה ולעסקי הנדל"ן המשפחתיים שלו. ההסתבכות שלו בסקנדל נערת הליווי לא הפכה אותו למתון או זהיר יותר בהתבטאויותיו. So how corrupt is the financial structure of uh, the US economy today? Well, corrupt is a hard word. It, it carries legal implications. What I would say is that we have deep structural problems. There are conflicts of interest woven into the structure since we repealed Glass-Steagall, not to get too technical, since commercial banking and investment banking have come under one roof. We have all sorts of conflicts that have inured to the benefit of the banks and have hurt consumers. We have expansive power because of concentration of capital. It is getting worse, not better, since the cataclysm of 08. We have seen the power and concentration of wealth and decision-making get more and more centralized, not less, all of which serves to diminish competition, serves to harm businesses that want to borrow because access to capital is not only limited, but the terms are more difficult for them. And it is contrary to the principles that should govern our economy, both that would generate growth and stability. So we have deep structural problems that have not been addressed adequately by Dodd-Frank uh, or any of the other reform measures put into place. Who controls the regulators in the U.S. and the legislators of the uh, financial markets, of the, uh, of the big uh, uh, private sector, are they all controlled by uh, public interest or by the big corporations? Well, it's a difficult question to answer, of course. I, I think we have had a period, 10 or 15 years, of overwhelming regulatory failure. Some of it was intentional when I was attorney general and we tried to in, bring certain investigations Some of the regulators took the side of the banks trying to shut us down. The OCC, the Office of the Controller of the Currency, is literally owned by the banks, and yet it is supposed to be one of the primary regulators. The New York Fed, that sets the standards, capital ratios, and so many of the other critical numbers, itself is literally owned by the banks. And so the regulatory agencies, in my view, not only failed, but did not even understand what their mandate was. Now, Is it corrupt in terms of money in a paper bag? No, I think it's much more subtle than that. I mean, really what you have here is a worldview that, that has overtaken many of the regulatory entities. It was an ideology that was, I think, wrong. You had a revolving door problem with many of the high-level regulators, which was itself really a manifestation of the sort of socialized common value system that, that led them not to see what was happening. Okay, how do we solve the problem of the revolving uh, doors? For people who work at the SCC, uh, making salaries of the public service, and then they know if they go to work for the banks, they make 100 times as much. So how can they not be totally uh, pursuing uh, the interest of the big uh, uh, companies? Well, I don't want to pretend to have an, an answer or the answer. I can tell you what I did when I was Attorney General, which was Attorney General of New York, and that was to hire lawyers, investigators, accountants, who shared my perspective on what we needed to do. Some of them have gone on afterwards to work for big institutions, but when we were working at the AG's office, we turned over every rock, we looked for every theory, we pursued the public interest in, because that was the DNA of these individuals. That was the psyche of these individuals. That's what they wanted to do. It goes to the question of, does the person at the top, himself, herself, really have the willpower, the backbone, to push as hard as is necessary to overturn accepted social perspectives. And if you look at the persons at the top today, at the, at the major uh, uh, regulatory agencies in the U.S., what do you see? Well, I think it's a little better than it used to be. 
back when President Bush was in office, and again, I don't say this to say they were corrupt as in getting cash. They didn't believe in their mission. They, did, they, they, they believed in, in this, this notion of self-regulation, that they believed that the banks of their own accord would stop doing things that would harm the public interest. Now, we know, looking back, that's rank silliness. It was just, just absurd. Now, some of us at the time were screaming from the, from the rooftops, stop, this is not going to lead to a good result. But they believed in this ideology. And it, the, the cost to society of that belief has been enormous. I mean, the, the cataclysm of 08, you know, words don't describe the harm to people. So we need to get people who understand what regulators are supposed to do, who understand what the big business is supposed to do. You know, what, what's your take on the Occupy Wall Street movement? I support its effort to change the conversation, its effort to say, wait a minute, guys, the system is broken. And if we are here in 2011 with greater concentration in the banking sector than we had before things began, still have not unraveled the conflicts of interest, still have not put controls in place for compensation, still have not prosecuted people for what happened, are we making any progress? And the distribution of wealth is getting worse, not better. We have deep, deep structural problems. Occupy Wall Street is to a certain extent a visceral scream of anger. It, it is not an articulated set of five policies, but that's okay, that's what it's supposed to be. And how important is breaking the concentration in the financial uh, markets if we want to bring in changes? Critical, it's very important. Because from the perspective of business, from the perspective of ordinary citizens, from the perspective of equity, when you have concentration like that, nothing good will happen. You know, it's very surprising to hear, you know, in Israel we know that we have a small club that controls 50% of the economy. When you look like at the United States, which is a huge economy, it's very difficult to, to grasp that here too you can have a very close-knit club of, I don't know, 50 companies and uh, 10,000 executives that are in some way very coordinated in the way they, they manipulate or the way they influence the government. Yeah, but it's a nice club to be in, don't you think? I mean, this is, look, there, there's a balance that has to be struck. I'm a capitalist. I, I, I always make that point because I don't want people to think that somehow, oh, he, he doesn't understand wealth creation. I'm a capitalist. You're sitting here in this is a family office. We've done well by competing, putting money at risk, building, creating wealth. That's what I believe in. What I don't believe in is when you corrupt the capitalist system with clubs, with allocating bids, with violating principles of fiduciary duty, with cheating your clients. That is what we should not permit. And so what we need to do is go back to first principles about what capitalism is. And in order to have a capitalism that works, you need a government that enforces rules. And, and that's think, what we didn't have. And do you think that the media in the U.S. is independent and professional enough to deal with those issues? You know, the, it's interesting. The media over the last 20 years has changed. And in an odd way for the better. And the reason I say that is that technology has made it possible for any person to be the media. Any person with uh, a smartphone can take a video and post it online and suddenly information flows in a way that was never possible 20 years ago. It used to be that we had three networks and half the country got its news at 6.30 every evening from three people who gave you in 20 minutes what they wanted you to hear. Now, I think the, the sort of exponential increase in information flow is a good thing, and we have media that spans the spectrum. So I think we are seeing an evolution in the media here in the United States with John Stewart and Steve Colbert. If you're under 30, you get your news from them. And I, so I think we're seeing progress in terms of information sources. And do you think that we are witnessing history today when the public discourse because of Occupy Wall Street and because of the financial markets, are we witnessing history and the capitalistic system of the United States is going to look different in the next 10 years? Or in a year time we'll see that, you know, the, 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 you know, the powerful uh, forces that are behind this structure will not let go and it will be very difficult to change the restructure. The, I guess the best answer I can give you is I don't know. I'd like to think we are seeing change. Change is very hard to effectuate. Um, and how aware is the general public, American public of the challenges and of the nature of the structure of the economy in the not, financial not, markets? Not aware enough. In other words, I see the anxiety of the public 
which is born not out of an intellectual understanding or, or concern about concentration of capital, but out of a reality that middle class incomes are sinking, unemployment is high, home prices are falling, jobs are scarce, jobs are fleeing to Asia, Latin America, and Africa. That reality is what drives public anxiety. And on the one hand, you get the Tea Party. On the other hand, you get Occupy Wall Street. Each of them, an emotional response to uh, a visceral sense that something is wrong. Now, will these movements, very different in their political answers, coalesce around a reform agenda that gets, permits us to change? I don't know. On the Republican agenda right now is an effort, once again, to go back to a deregulatory world that I think will make th things much worse. And so I don't know which way we will go. But I think when you look deeper into the presidential race next year, in 2012 here in the United States, it is very much a debate about what government should do and what government needs to do to control a marketplace that has not generated good results in the last few years. Okay, and do you think that under the current political and economical structure, Obama can be can go after the financial system, or uh, maybe because of the donate because of the uh, fi uh, campaign financing and because of the control of media and so on, basically he'll have to just uh, talk the talk and not walk the walk. I don't know. I don't think it's because of the campaign contributions. I, I don't think Barack Obama says, "Gee, I have to be nice to Wall Street because of the money." I, I don't think it's that crass, and, and I think he is a much finer person than that. Barack Obama is an intellect. He is superbly smart. Uh, I, I think that he simply didn't view Wall Street the way I do and I think the way you do. He didn't see the financial services sector as being structurally flawed when he became president. Uh, what his views are today, I don't know. But, 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 but initially he had Paul Volcker as, as his right. advisor, and then he switched it to Jeff Imlet. So you think, you know, right. we know what uh, Volcker, we, we, right. we guess what Volcker told him. Right. Well, and now you have Jeff Imlet instead of Volcker. Well, look, I, I said from early on that his cabinet was not change you can believe in. His cabinet was continuity you can believe in. You had Ben Bernanke, you had Tim Geithner, you had Larry Summers. The, the reform voices, Paul Volcker, you know, Joe Stiglitz, Paul Krugman, were marginalized. Now, I'm hoping the president has reevaluated that. I'm not sure he has, but I, I certainly agree that early on we did not see significant reform efforts that were commensurate with the magnitude of the problem. How this, all this conversation that we're talking about uh, uh, is related to the 1% against the 99%? Well, it, it all goes hand in glove because the, now there are many factors, technology, globalization, some of the laws of economics not only can't be repealed, you, you, they're a reality. And, and so the, the past 30 years has seen a globalization that necessarily makes it easier for capital to move around the globe, invest, and labor has lost some of its negotiating power, which has hurt the middle class. Having said that, the changes in the financial services sector here in the United States accentuated that and created an overlay where capital was at a very great advantage, and we saw uh, the consequences, I've seen the consequences of that in terms of income distribution. Uh, uh, a year ago I asked Warren Buffett, is the uh, United States a democracy or a plutocracy? And his answer was, uh, well, we are turning into a plutocracy. Do you uh, share this? Uh... Well, I think we are both. We are a democracy. I mean, look, I, I take great pride, as I think, all citizens here should, in the sense that you know, over 200 years ago, we had confidence in this demo notion of democracy that nobody back then believed in. We're still here. We're still practicing it. It is flawed in many ways, as we know, but it has permitted us to survive and become uh, a nation premised on the notion of voting, tolerance, and freedom. And so I never want to speak ill of who we are, what we stand for, and how we have projected those notions around the world, including to the, to the state of Israel. And as an American Jew, this is a bond that is very meaningful to me. Having said that, there are deep flaws in our democratic process and the power of finance right now to warp what government does for or to our financial services sector in particular has led to grave problems, and in that domain, we are a plutocracy.